Hello and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we take a look at the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Luke DeWolf. And I'm Dan Larrabee. Today, this is episode number four, where we are continuing our series on the Poetic Edda. Today we're starting our look at the Havamal, the second poem of the Poetic Edda. Dan, what can you tell us about this poem? Well, the uh, Havamal is a uh a poem that's basically um, maxims or proverbs for life. Uh, the translation of the Havamal is words of the one-eyed or words of the high one, uh, meaning Odin. And it's kind of a, a patchwork poem that has a, a bunch of different uh, sections that while in the text it's not clearly marked out like what section you're in, but by the subject matter, you can clearly tell what part. So like the first part is about how to be in the world with guests. Um, there's some stuff about, um, you know, love and uh, even magic as you go on. So it's pretty interesting. The um, There isn't a date associated with the Havamal. The sort of the only source of it is in the uh, Codex Regius. And because of its format, it's kind of impossible to tell uh, when verses might have been added or taken away or switched around in order. So it's uh, it's kind of a mystery. But funnily enough, the uh, for each section, the, the subject matter sticks pretty closely together. You can really tell where things start to change. Um, and that's that's sort of it for the the interesting stuff that surrounding the Havamal. Absolutely. And, and just to reiterate, this is oh. all attributed to Odin. Uh, that's, uh, if that wasn't clear, this is all supposed to be his wisdom or his his stories. And if someone was taking this all and compiling it all together, the, the common thread through all of it, because it does get quite different, uh, especially after about verse 83, 84, something like that. For sure. It uh, takes a bit of a turn. Uh, the, the common thread is that this is Odin's wisdom or Odin's stories of gaining wisdom. So it's, it's all, it's all to do with Odin, which we've, uh, we've dealt with a, a fair bit before in the, the three previous episodes on the Voluspa. Good introduction to Odin there. And I'll also uh, clarify the Codex Regius for those of you just joining us. It's a, a great, fantastic manuscript uh, dated about to the 13th century. And uh, in many cases, it's the only source where we actually have uh, for, for these poems and uh, and all this uh, great lore. And that is the case for the Havamal. So uh, thankfully, we do have that resource available to us. For sure. And in fact, it was the, uh, the source for the uh, Voluspa that we just did. That's where, that's the version that... Uh, we uh, looked at from the Codex Regius. So That's it's, right. It's uh, a pretty important manuscript for, I guess, Northern European mythology and, and history. Absolutely. So if we're all on the same page now, let's just uh, dive right into it. For sure. However, we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, mention which book we were using. We're using the Poetic Edda by uh, Jackson Crawford. And it's a, a great version of the Poetic Edda. It's uh, uh, very readable. It it really captures the spirit of it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found especially for the Havamal actually, which which has some some kind of obtuse uh, stanzas in there, hard to understand and interpret. Jackson Crawford's done a fantastic job of of making it understandable. And so there there'll be the odd case where we'll make a, a note to uh, another translation, which may have. Uh, you know, shed a, a, a different perspective on it. But for the most part, this is, I think, the, the best version of the Havamal out there for the modern reader. So for sure. check it out. Uh, definitely take a look. Uh, we're, we're including the link to the book below uh, for Amazon. Uh, if you'd like to pick it up and follow along with us, highly encourage it. And we'll also have a link to his uh, YouTube page, Jacqueline Crawford. He's, I'm going to mess this up, but he's a professor of... Uh, uh, li linguistics. Linguistics. Uh, among other things. With a specialty in Old Norse, and his stuff is amazing. So you, you know, it's definitely worth checking out and watching. Absolutely, he actually just recently uh, uh, published a, a video on a summation of the Voluspa, the, the literal translation, and how he got to his uh, his uh, meanings of it as well. So yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely worth checking out. Worth checking out. So thanks again to Jackson Crawford and to Hackett Publishing. For sure. 
All right, shall we? Without further ado. Shall we dive in? Yep. How's it going, Dan? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm good. 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 Let's get that out of the way. For sure. Okay. The Havamal. Stands of one. At every doorway, before you enter, you should look around. You should take a good look around, for you never know where your enemies might be seated within. Dan, what does that mean? Well, just going from face value, it's it's a great, uh, I think, a, a great introduction to lessons for life. Wherever you are, you need to figure. You first of all, you need to figure out where you are and who you're with, because if you don't, first of all, if you don't know where you are, you're not going to know the rules of the game being played, and you're not going to know who's going to take advantage of you not knowing the rules of the game being played. So, in in some ways, and you'll find this a lot. Um, it kind of comes on under the. Uh, the scout motto of be prepared. And it really is like whenever you go somewhere, just figure out where you're at so that you can behave accordingly because you don't want to, you don't want to make a fool of yourself. You also don't want to leave yourself open to uh, deceit or enemies that don't have your best interests at heart. And I think, I think it's funny that to talk about things like this, you know, cause you know, back in the day, People had swords and seemed to be a much rougher time and all that kind of stuff, Vikings, whatever. But it's still true today. Just because we're not we're not at each other's throats literally and or willing to kill each other as readily as they might have been in, you know, past ages, it doesn't mean you don't have enemies all around you that if they have the chance will stab you in the back and make your life hard. Possibly more metaphorically these days as opposed yes, to literally. For but sure. Yeah, yeah. But it's still, they can, there's still people out there that are, are plotting. And usually it's not, it might not be personal. It's just, they're going to get ahead and you're in their way. Other times it is personal and they're plotting to make your life worse. And that's something else I wanted to mention about this verse is that there's a few, um, assumptions made by this verse is that one, you're expected to take care of yourself. It's not up to other people. It's it's up to you to figure out where you are. And that there there is evil in this world. And there is chaos. And that, again, it's up to you to manage that in relation to your own life so that you're, you're not getting walloped all the time. It's uh, They really put an emphasis on personal responsibility in this. So... I think this is a great introduction to that. It it really encapsulates a whole bunch of values that you're going to see further on in in the Havamal. In the Havamal. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I, I love that point about uh, knowing where you are. That's that's a fantastic uh, idea. It, it's it's more of a psychological state, even more so than literally knowing where you are. I mean, it, it always helps if you know exactly where you are in the world. You know, you're you're in your home or or someone else's home. Or, you know, if you're just out on the street, you know what crossroad you're at, what intersection you're at, something like that, so you can find your way around. So literally, that, that makes sense. But it's it's a psychological state as well, and I think that's what you were Definitely. getting at. Right? Absolutely. So in, in, in that particular state, it's it's that, you know, you, you know where you are if everyone is behaving the way you expect. And if that ever changes, you don't know where you are. That's a, a key principle of, of the idea of living on the border between order and chaos. And it's that if, if something were to change, you, you know, say someone were to start attacking someone randomly or, or, you know, a, a person who obviously has kind of something wrong going on, uh, you know, starts violently attacking someone while screaming sure. <laughs> bad words, something like that, uh, you know, unprovoked, you wouldn't know where you are psychologically. And it would be how you you deal with that and how prepared you are to deal with something like that, that you, that would see how you react to that sort of situation, how you would succeed there. So that's, no, I think this is a, this is a great setup. And my, my, uh, my thought about it was that this is essentially about unexplored territory as well. It, this is implying. So first of all, the, the word is at every doorway, right? So it's, first of all, it's, it's, familiar places if you're going to go somewhere familiar you need to make sure 
that it is, is still the way you left it or the way you expect it, something like that. You know, don't complacently go into some place uh, without checking it out sort of thing, even if you're there every day, even if you live there or it's your workplace, you know. You don't want uh, there to be something unexpected that uh, completely catches you off guard. But then it would also be the the unfamiliar, right, which would uh, constitute unexplored territory, which is what you're theoretically supposed to be striving for if you're going to, you know, find any sort of success, you know, pushing the boundaries of, of what you know, and, and that's by going through unexplored territory. And so this, I, I think this is a great kickoff because it's, it's it's encapsulating something that uh, is going to apply in almost any situation, and um, the the concept of going through a doorway as well is is also just a good way to kind of bound the the space of the poem. Uh, uh, very good choice uh, stylistically uh, from from that perspective as well. So I think uh, you pretty well caught uh, all the things that I was. Uh, going to talk about as well so if you have yeah, you anything else to add I, I was thinking about something uh while you're uh, talking about the points you wanted to cover i think there's also an expectation um that you are going to journey out in, in into the world and when you're talking about going out and into the unknown to sort of find its treasures and to grow and to find wisdom again like if, if you're going out into the unknown the first way you make the unknown known is kind of check it out and see, see what you can glean from it immediately. So yeah, you know, I'm just thinking like if you're heading out into the forest kind of thing and you know, you check outside and you see it's sunny. Okay. You're not going to need a, you know, the rain jacket or whatever, but if you see like a bear outside sort of wandering around, you might want to stay inside for a bit, like, or you know, take a weapon. You like it. There's, it's every doorway. It really, like when you said that, I was like, yeah, every doorway. Yeah, absolutely. Is anytime you go out, just have an idea of where you are and where the potential, the potential chaos might be. And you're always going to miss stuff, but at least you're going to have that base level of preparedness. Yeah. It's, it's really a call to pay attention, mm -hmm. I think, which is, is, is something that honestly we're, we're going to see it's a common thread here. Just the, the idea of being alert and, and paying attention to your surroundings and, and what's around you. And, and, uh, you, you know, that's, that's, uh, a great way to, to start us off here for sure. Definitely. I'm going to move on to verse number two. Okay. Back to the poem. Hail to a good host. A guest has come inside. Where should he sit? He is impatient, standing on the threshold, ready to try his luck. So, first of all, you can tell that we're, we're getting into how to be a good host, which, you know, many of the uh, following stanzas will, will cover, sort of different aspects of it. And on the face, there's, there's actually a lot of value there because it's about how, how to behave in the world, how to follow the rules of the game that society has put out, how to, you know, how to get along with other people and, you know, basically not, not being a jerk. It's sort of how one of, one of the ways to not be a jerk, uh, something I found interesting about it, and I don't know if this is reading too much into it, but I, I started thinking of it as uh, the idea of inviting chaos or the unknown into your life, like we were talking about before, that because you you need it to you need it to uh, develop and grow and become wise and all that that kind of stuff, and if you go. If you face wisdom, or sorry, if you face chaos, sort of begrudgingly, you don't really grow from it. You you just sort of get angry and, and pissed off at the world, and then you're you get stuck. You've just survived it, but you don't. You just learn. survive. You don't learn. But if you're able to invite it in as a guest, one, you're not you're not inviting it in like willy nilly. It's like yeah, chaos, come on, you know, wreck stuff. It's like, no, 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 there is chaos 
and I'm willingly going to face it and I'm willingly going to deal with it. And, you know, for lack of a, a better term, I'm, I'm going to take up my cross and march up that hill willingly. And so when I kind of took a, a more like meta uh, meaning out of it, that there is, there is going to be chaos and it's going to come to your front doorstep. Well, why not invite it in to deal with it on your terms and, um, and you know, welcome it. You don't, it doesn't, and it doesn't mean we all know those people that invite chaos into their lives in a bad way where they, they just do reckless and stupid things. And you're like, well, of course your life is going like that. This is more of a, when, when bad stuff happens, you kind of roll with it and you say, okay, let's, let's deal with it from here. I, that, that is a fantastic point. I, I had not thought of this particular stanza that way. So yeah, good, good point. Uh, on on the the practical side of it, it's uh, I think hospitality is the the word for this this common thread this section here, and what I got from it is that it's so hail to a good host. A good host has to have enough with them to provide hospitality. You, you I think literally you have to have a home for someone to visit. Right, whether you own it or rent, whatever, it doesn't matter too much. But but you need to have a certain amount of resources in this world to be able to give it away, and so I think that is another call to um, strive to have enough in the world to be able to spread the wealth, spread the love, something like that. That's what I got out of um, out of that, and. The other side of it as well, the the second half of the stanza, um, something about luck. The the guest is ready to try his luck. So I don't want to get too deep into this as a concept because it's it's first of all it's different from the idea of luck that we have now. As as in general, you know, many of these concepts uh, had different or deeper meaning than before. The, the idea of wisdom being another one uh, that they gave a lot more meaning to the word wisdom before. But luck, it's not just, you know, the throw of the dice. In, in this case, I think the connotation is something like, um, well, even the turn of phrase, try his luck. So it, it implies some agency. The guest is is going to do something, put forward some kind of an action with the intention of some kind of result. And then I think that's what they mean by try his luck, his or her, I'm sure. Um, and, and really what I read out of that is, is something like you have to try. You don't, you don't get anything if you don't try. You have to make the attempt to put your luck out into the world. So, so again, going, going into the unknown from the opposite perspective. And the concept of hospitality as well is a two-sided coin. There's the hospitality of the host, and then there's the hospitality that the guest is expected to show. And so I, it, we will see later, I think, something to to do with, um, you, you know, being a good guest in general, For sure. but, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a two sided thing. And so the guest is also going into an unknown situation, like we saw in the, the first stanza by just stepping over the threshold. So it's an unknown for both parties and they're both facing the unknown. The guest is trying his luck. It's, uh, an interesting image that we kind of get going here. It, it really is actually you saying that standing on the threshold that I didn't realize how well connected it is with the first stanza, but it really is that he's going to try his luck in this new spot that there may be enemies, there may be pitfalls, but he's going to go for it. Yeah, so, absolutely. and, and that's, that's how you have to do it. You can't, and actually they mentioned that in a few stanzas too, that you have to, you actually have to participate in the world. You can't, you can't just, you know, hang out and hope for the best. Yeah, it's it's a the, the the two stanzas taken together. I think are a good call to action to face the unknown um, preparedly, something like that. And both guest and host need to be prepared and watchful. And you have to put your luck out into the world. The the whole combination of all those ideas they they may seem a little bit disjointed uh, taken together, but you don't know no, as the, as they uh, as they kind of come together in this in this couple of verses here. It's uh, it, 
yeah, I, I like the idea that it's a call to action to, to face the unknown from both perspectives. So for sure, I think I will move on. Let's do it. All right. Back to the poem. He needs a fire. The one who has just come in, his knees are shivering. Food and dry clothes will do him well after his journey over the mountains. So what I take this to mean is that there's a time for journeying into the unknown and a time for, I guess, well, rest is one way to say it, but I would say consolidating the unknown that you've made into the known. So when, you know, after a journey over the mountains, you know, presumably from the unknown, you do actually need to rest where as humans, we don't have a, an inexhaustible supply of energy and resources. So there, there's an ebb and flow to searching in the unknown and then coming back to the known and sort of getting your house in order. And if you have a guest who presumably a friend who's, who's done that, like why not support them in that? And if the, if they're doing and living how they should be, Absolutely. Like, why not support them in that? Because it'll benefit you and, and them. Yeah. Great, uh, great point. And, and you know, it's funny you say, presumably the person who's in your house is a friend, you, you know, my first reaction to that just now was that not necessarily your friend, but no, honestly, if, if you've invited someone into your home, uh, that's already a bond of trust, right? For and, sure. and I, I think that's at the very least the first step to friendship. I'm actually, um, Actually, jumping ahead a little bit, the very next stanza I think should uh, go into that idea a little bit more, honestly. But um, I and I, I like uh, you know what you're saying about coming into the known. It, for for me, I just took more about you, you know preparedness, you need to ensure you have enough resources from again both perspectives from host and guest, and and you know the, it's just an interesting. Um, dichotomy here the the two roles that they're they're bringing up right from the beginning the idea of host and the idea of guest but both sort of need to have their roles their their part to play and and it's the host job to provide this service this uh you know fire right uh, warmth food dry clothes but then it's it's i think it's also um the guest's responsibility to make sure that he is behaving well enough to earn that something like that I think I think you're right. I've when you're talking about the the dynamic of the host and the guest, I'm I was kind of thinking like what are the and we 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 will see some of that like the responsibilities between the two. But it is interesting that they've set up this dichotomy right away that there's obviously something of importance here. And I mean, I'm not claiming to know all of it, but it's definitely worth looking at and Maybe it's just knowing, knowing what to do when you're the host or when you're the guest, because you're going to, you're going to be both throughout your life. Exactly. I, I think that's the, the biggest overarching theme here in this, in this section is that it's, it's the, these roles are something that it's going to come up over and over and, and you're going to cycle between being the host and being the guest. You know, when you, when you're putting yourself out there, when you've gone into the unknown, you know, you're, you're generally reliant on the good graces of other people across the board. You're, you're reliant on society existing as it should. You, you know, I, I, I would say that, you know, my bus driver in the morning is, is being a good host by allowing me to come onto his bus sort of thing. But then that, that trickles up and up, you know, into the level of, you know, city government and, and society in, in general, you, you know, we've, we've all got this, uh, intricate social contract where we expect, uh, behavior right and and just as as you go in life it's it's reciprocal definitely so uh one one last point here i, I just wanted to make a note of uh the the, the idea he fire is needful is actually the the wording in the larrington translation which is the one we'll most often reference um another good one to check out if you like um this just goes back to if if uh, you remember our uh our episodes on the Voluspa fire played a big role in the destruction of the world. And so 
in this context, this is fire as a good thing. Fire as something that provides warmth and life, renewal. So it's it's just a, a, a little note that uh, these spirits of fire, these dangerous spirits of fire that were destroying the world, you know, when, when they're left out completely uh, chaotically to just do their thing, you know, they're, they're bad. But when it's properly controlled, chaos put into order, it can create some fantastic things. And even evolutionarily, you know, our, our discovery of fire and our mastery of fire, because I think other animals do uh, have some rudimentary, especially the, the chimps and stuff have been able to, there's evidence, right, that they, that fire has been used, but never mastered, right? Yes. I, like, I don't think chimps are able to make fire. But they but use it I think if they see, like, if there is a fire, they're, I think they are happy to use it, like, often, like, to go after the other chimps. This is fully off the top of yeah. my head, just something I think I've, I've heard, could be wrong, feel free to correct us. Definitely. Or post links to videos of chimps with fire because that'd be pretty neat. That'd be cool if, if someone had a video of that. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, that was just a, a point about uh, overarching the, the idea of fire and also these characters that have a bad side, an obvious bad side in the Voluspa, you, you know, the, the positive side of it and and just the, the idea that if you take this chaotic, destructive thing and put order into it, it can be a tool. A fantastic tool and, and so you you should is absolutely it, it really shows the point of needing to go out and face chaos so that you can get very valuable tools like fire which like you can't really overstate the importance of fire in human evolution it we cooking food, cooking food protection against wild animals uh making sure we don't freeze during the night that's that's it's what really, this is. That's exactly what it is. So yeah, just wanted to touch on that a little bit. So I'm going to move on. Let's do it. Back to the poem. He needs water. The one who has just arrived dry clothes and a warm welcome from a friendly host. And if he can get it a chance to listen and be listened to. I like this uh, stanza one. It, it's interesting because the last one started with he needs a fire and this one is he needs water. And if we remember uh, from the Voluspa, the, actually I don't know if they go into detail or if it's in the prose edda, but fire and ice or water is the necessary components for the creation of, you know, everything. So I like that they... I like that the themes are consistent throughout these myths. They, there was a, they knew what they're talking about and sort of ha, they actually had a, a system of uh, symbols that, that that's fairly consistent and it's true. I mean, everyone needs water so that it, it's a, it's a very basic need and that, you know, you die in a few days rather than without water. Whereas like food you can go for two weeks kind of thing. And right. But, uh, and then showing, to, you know, to be a friendly host, you're, you're providing shelter and a chance to listen and be listened to. And that to me shows a, well, it's an exchange of ideas and an exchange of wisdom. So if someone has come back from a journey, they're going to be able to share what they've learned and they're going to have missed things that went on in their, in the area that they label as, as known, they're going to have missed things that will chip away at what they know of the area so that they'll be able to reorient themselves in the known area and bring back knowledge of unknown area that they can begin orienting this person, their host to that. So it's a, it's a very valuable exchange of ideas. And of course, like, just think of yourself, like when you visit people, the first thing you ask is like, Hey, how's it going? And then sort of talk about what's gone on in your, in your journey, in your life sort of recently and things develop from there. It's, uh, it's important, but it's also like one of the most common things that humans do when they see someone they haven't seen in a bit. It might not even be, it, it might be just like your spouse goes out for, you know, get groceries and they come back and, Oh, how is, how's getting groceries? You know? 
as simple and as common as that, but there's actually value to it that we sort of take for granted. Yeah, that's that's a good point that we that we take it for granted. I mean, it, this is incredibly descriptive of how trust is built and how friendships are built. But but also, uh, that's, that's a very good point that it's it's continual. This is something that's going to happen if you're if you're meeting someone for the first time or if you're meeting someone for the hundredth time, right? And and it's it's just something that's going to keep on going. It's uh, yeah, just that that bond of. Uh, of reciprocal exchange of ideas. I mean that that in and of itself is is a common thread here for how you just exchange wisdom and and knowledge and I mean there there's huge emphasis placed on on that discussion. We'll we'll see different contexts of dis- discussion and and kind of how that plays out for people going forward here. Uh, I did want to just sort of make um a note to a story that uh, the good Dr. Peterson mentions uh, at least once, I think, uh, Jordan Peterson, who uh, we'll talk a little bit about more at the end. Um, he, he tells a story as, uh, about, not necessarily a story, but the, the idea is that in, in order to, uh, to make a friend, a great way to do it is to ask for a favor, which you know, most reasonable people will, will give, uh, you know, if it wasn't something ridiculous, you, you know, Hey, can I, uh, uh, can I borrow your, your phone, make a call, something, something sure. like that. That's less relevant these days, but I don't know why that's my example, but, um, but then you're obligated in reverse. And that's the point is, is to create that obligation upon yourself to that person. And then, you know, they, they are fully able to, to call in that chit, uh, if, if they would like, and that's just something to build bonds of trust. And so, in this particular case, uh, I mean, I, I think that's that's it's uh, applicable here because this is just how you know the guest gets to know the host and vice versa, and how they just build a bond of trust. And, and I mean, the the reciprocal thing, the favor that, that the guest is asking for is for all these things, but then the the reciprocal side of it is that you know the guest is has now received these things from the host, and the host should be able to expect equally in return later if he's ever in the same position, something like that. Definitely. So it all, it all ties together. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I think, uh, that's all I had for that one. Me so, too. Back to the poem. A man needs wisdom. If he plans to wander widely, life is easier at home. He'll be laughed at, if he sits among the wise and has nothing to say. I also like this one. I, I'm going to say that a lot about uh, these stanzas. So life is obviously easier at home because you know where everything is. You've got all your favorite stuff there. It's, uh, you know, everyone you're, you're set up. You don't have to, you really don't have to exert yourself and you don't have to pay attention to a lot of things, but you need to, one, if you want to get wisdom or exercise your wisdom, you're going to have to wander outside of your home, outside of your, the known area that you have and, and explore and sort of figure stuff out from there. And, you know, at the very beginning, we talked about the expectation that you go out into the world. Well, here it is again. It's that you have, you have to go out and wander the world because if you don't, you're going to remain ignorant and people will laugh at you. And, <laughs> and it's interesting in uh, Crawford, he says, uh, he'll be laughed at if he sits among the wise and has nothing to say. In, uh, in Larrington, she says, uh, you'll be laughed at if you, if you don't know anything. So the language that there's a, a small difference because I could see people reading this and thinking, Oh, well, I don't have anything to say because you know, because you're learning, you're, you're sitting among wise people and you're just sort of soaking it in and you're not, you don't have anything meaningful to add because you're learning things that you didn't know before. And that's not what, that's, that's not what uh, like Crawford's translation is saying or Larrington's is that, if you don't know anything, what you, what you say will be will be nothing. There, it, there's going to be no substance to it, no value to it. 
And I think that's the, the proper understanding of having nothing to say is that it's, you'll, you'll be spewing out words, but they're hollow and garbage. So, and then that's why they laugh at you because you're saying things you have, you just don't know what you're talking about really is what it comes down to because you haven't, you haven't gone out of your comfort zone to learn things. Yeah. I I love that. That kind of catch 22 here is that you, uh, you can't know things without going out and wandering. But if you, if you go out and, you know, try something for the first time, you obviously know very little, right? So it's, so it's, you know, you're going out there, you're putting yourself out there to get this experience, but you might not necessarily have much to contribute at the beginning. And so it's, so it's hard. I think that describes why it's hard to try new things, new activities, and, and to get yourself into new social situations, because you might not necessarily have a great number of things that you can talk about that you can bring to the table. But you know, this, this absolutely says that you, that you have to get out there anyway, right? Because if you, if you don't get out there at all, you'll have nothing to say, period. Right. So, so it's, it's sort of a, a feedback loop. If you, if you get yourself going and you get yourself out there with people, you, you know, you'll, you'll get more experience and people will like having you around because you'll have interesting things to say or, or things to bring to the table versus, you know, the opposite side of it. If, if you just bring yourself, keep yourself at home, you're not going to gain new experiences, new, new knowledge. And then if you do, you know, put yourself out there every once in a while, you'll get shot down consistently and maybe just want to run back into your, to your hidey hole there. And For sure. And, and so it's, I think it's all about the attitude of how you, how you approach that, you know, are, are you going into a new situation with the intent to grow and learn and okay may, i mean maybe you'll get laughed at as you're as you're trying but you still need to try you still need to get that experience so and if you've ever been in a situation where you're learning something new and you're doing it earnestly and with humility you do get laughed at by people who have done it before but it's not like a it's not a mean laugh or, or at least you shouldn't take it as a mean laugh it's a you're being, you're being brought into the fold and they're testing you to see if you can, if you can deal with the situations that they they've dealt with. And that's sort of like, that's actually kind of the first step. Can you be accepted in, into the group so that they can show you the things that you, you're going to need to learn? And one of the initiation rights, I guess, is sort of, they're going to make fun of you a bit. And your best bet is to laugh because well, you are being ridiculous. You have no idea what you're doing. Like, just laugh at it. It is funny. And, you know, but they'll, if you can, if you laugh with them, they take, they take you, they welcome you in and they're like, okay, yeah, this guy is going to be fine. And, you know, we're okay. We'll show him because he's worth it. And if they give you a jab, if you can jab them right back. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, you, you might still be uh, this worthless new guy, but, you know, if, if you can give it as good as you can take it and stick around, then that should all work out. For so sure. That's, that's, uh, I think that that pretty much happens in any social situation. Definitely. Right. And, uh, and so that's, that's just a, a good lesson for kind of how to be, but, but also, uh, well, I, I think it's a, it's a, again, a call to action, but also a warning against you know, just staying at home. Life is easier at home. I mean, yes, it is, but it's, it's not going to work out for you by going out into the world. You, you, the, the goal shouldn't be to just make this nice, cozy nest at home. And that's, that's all you ever do. You never leave your house. That shouldn't be the goal. Right. And, and I, and I don't think if you, if you go through life with that as your goal, I don't think it's going to turn out great. No. Right. I, I think that's what this is. This is saying it's, it's just, uh, you know, you, you have to go out into the world and you, you know, if you go out into this, this unexplored territory, you need to have wisdom with you and you need to plan that, you know, the, the wording here is a man needs wisdom if he plans to wander widely. So, I mean, that, that puts emphasis on the word plan. So you, you have to have a game plan if you're, if you're going to go out into the unknown. So, so this is also something like don't don't go out into chaos just for the sake of it without any preparation like before oh, right definitely. like you have to you have to have a game plan you have to 
pay attention. You have to have your wits about you. Wits are needful is the, the wording in Larrington. I might have said that already. Um, no, you, you have to have all these things. Then, then you can acquire the new experiences and and hold your own in the, the new social social situation or, you know, with the wise people. So For sure. In fact, some of it, knowing that you need wisdom to, and that plan, if you're going to, if you're going to wander, that in itself is, is wisdom. So it's, uh, it's probably, it's actually probably a pretty, uh, one of the most useful bits of wisdom you can have. If you recognize that you need, you're going to need preparation to do these things because again, yeah, as we've said a few times now, if you just go out willy nilly, you're, it's not going to work out for you. No, not at all. I think, uh, Let's go back to the poem. Sounds good. A wise man is not showy about his wisdom. He guards it carefully. He is silent when he comes to a stranger's home. The wise man seldom wanders into harm, for you can never have a more faithful friend than a good supply of wisdom. I have lots to say about this one. Perfect. The the first thing that comes to mind is that old uh like that wartime saying loose lips sink ships so the idea being is you never want particularly among people you don't know you never want to show your full capabilities because holding that back it means you know something that they don't and you they're they're operating from a, pr- a place of ignorance if they're trying to harm you because you don't know if they're a stranger you don't know their um their goals you don't know what they're trying to do there's also some humility in that and that you're not you're not just sort of needlessly um showing people up with like how smart you are and no one likes know-it-alls and all that kind of stuff we're like we all find those people annoying it's sort of that idea that you just don't want to be that way. The other thing, and I, it made me think of uh, the art of war by Sun Tzu, and I, I wrote down uh, two two verses from one from book one and one from book three. And the, the art of war, I probably have all heard of it, but it's basically um, instructions for how to how to uh, manage war and conquest and that kind of stuff. But um, I remembered this it's a fairly famous part of the art of war where uh, Sun Tzu says, uh, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And it made me think of this because it, you're dep- if you're not showing your full capabilities and your full wisdom in front of a stranger, then they're at least operating from a place where even if they, they gain a victory, they're going to also gain defeat. So you're at least on a level playing field. If you're letting them know you without getting to know them, you're giving up your power and, you know, they're going to get to a point where they don't have to fear the outcome of a hundred battles. So, and, and this may seem extreme, like, oh, this isn't, you know, we're just talking about meeting people and strangers, but there is, there is such thing as a dominance hierarchy. And if you watch Dr. Jordan Peterson, you, you know how prevalent that is in society. And by giving your power away, you're making sure that you're dropping in the do- dominance hierarchy and staying low so it's it's not useful uh similarly um in in book one one of the very first verses of um of the the art of war is uh, all warfare is based on deception and we we live in a society where honesty is valued and it, and it is but that doesn't mean you have to it doesn't mean you have to go around telling all of your all of your secrets, everything about yourself to everyone, because that's not helpful. There are, there are people out there that are going to use that against you that, that want to harm you, that don't have your best interest at heart. 
so why give them power willingly and freely? So that that's a lot of what I took from from this verse that just you know watch yourself and be and be conscious of where you are and how much of yourself you give to people that you don't know. Fantastic. I, I mean, I I don't think I have much uh, much more to add to that. Uh, love the Sun Tzu reference. Uh, you don't get enough of those. Uh, well, yeah, I suppose uh, it's it's one of those books that you know, big CEOs have in their uh, For sure. have in their desks. Though it's uh, it's old, but it's it's very very uh, good book of wisdom, much like this one, I think. Um, no, that that's that's fantastic. It's something about keeping keeping your cards close to your chest. Uh, just that general idea that uh, that you should uh, um, you know keep some things to yourself. Not not out of necessarily uh, uh, any desire to hold back um, intentionally. I, I don't think that's the nuance here, but it, it, it's to guard yourself. And it's really also you know the the idea that you're silent when it comes to a stranger's home. You know that that's again just listening, paying attention. It, if you if you listen more than you than you talk then that's that's just going to work out for you i think is the is is the idea that they're hammering home here and you know the, there's certainly a time to to talk and to add to the conversation and whatnot but it should not be boastful and and humility i think is actually something that that's coming up more than i more than i thought just the the general idea that you should be humble with what you know in fact i think uh, another idea is that you you should just uh, you should assume that the person you're talking to knows something that you don't and and, and i mean if, if both people go into a conversation that way there's going to be a lot of listening and a lot of good exchange of information which is something again just just so emphasized here but uh yeah, the, it, it's really just not revealing your strengths if you if you don't have to, and uh, you know if if you if you talk a lot, you're revealed. It's sort of the flip side of the previous stanza, actually. Like you, you know, getting laughed at at the the table. You, you know, if you talk too much, if you try to do too much to to fit in, you'll you'll be revealed as an ignorant loser, for lack of a better term, for honestly. Sure. But. Uh, <laughs> um, no, and, and and it's just um, hammer hammering the idea on the on the head that you're you're just you should be seeking wisdom in general, right? So it's it's uh, seek wisdom, guard it, give it out sparingly. You know, some some good things to say for the sure. least. So that's all I have for that one. Yeah, and actually, I think if we get to the next one, it kind of ties it up in a nice bow. I agree. Definitely uh, end of a section, I think so. All right, back to the poem, stanza seven. The watchful guest, when he arrives for a meal, should keep his mouth shut, listening with his ears and watching with his eyes. That's how the wise get wiser. So we've just spent, you know, a few stanzas talking about how wise people act and what happens if you don't gain wisdom. And here we actually have how, how to gain wisdom. And it's by listening and watching and not talking. And it re one, it really fits when you said, uh, and that's Jordan Peterson, right? The, yeah. Um, talking, uh, just assuming that the person you're talking to knows something that you don't. I mean, that's basically what this is, is that you're assuming that they know things that you don't. And you have enough humility to realize that you should be listening. And we're really getting hit with the, the idea of humility because you, you can't learn without humility. It, learning it starts off with the assumption that there's something that you don't know. And... I mean, that's humbling in itself. If you think, oh, I know everything, you can't learn anything because you're not open to it. So, you know, you're going to a meal humbly and you realize there's things for you to learn. So you open your ears and eyes and then and just shut up and listen. And again, if you've ever been somewhere new or you want to learn something new, at 
that would have to be taught to you by other people. This is, and I, I've done this myself. I've seen it done. This is like the quickest way to endear yourself to them because it shows that you're there for the right reasons and that you you really want to learn. And most people, when they see that, they they see someone who actually wants to learn something and they, they're coming from a place of humility. They're more than happy to teach you because, I mean, there's a lot of value in teaching things as well. You learn as you as you teach, you probably learn more than the person you're teaching, but it um, it's the the right way to act, and it it's respectful, and it just everyone gets what they want out of it. So it, it really sums it up, and I, I think it's uh, really just ties it in a nice bow. Couldn't agree more. Honestly, I don't have anything to add. It really is just the the culmination of the last few ideas all in one little spot maybe the only thing that i would uh just say by extension is that you know for for the purposes of learning you know you should be asking a lot of questions as opposed to like the the idea in a direct opposition to trying to show boat or show off you know here's how much that i've gleaned in knowledge on my own no it should just be you know you ask questions and more questions and more questions. And I, I mean, I, th I think some people have the, the idea that, you know, asking questions is going to come off as annoying or something like that. But really, if, if you have the right attitude about it and, for it's, sure. and it's for genuine learning, then that's that's a good thing. I, I didn't uh, I didn't go that direction with uh, the stanza as far as specifically specifically learning or, or teaching or whatnot, but it's it's so applicable there. That's, yeah, it's a, it's a great section. It's... Um, well, as you said, you know, it's how the wise, well, <laughs> that's how the wise get wiser. That's the end of the stanza here, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's just a listen, pay attention. I mean, w what more advice is there than that? To just to kind of get started to, to better yourself and to grow. No, it's, it's laid right out there. Like they don't, there's nothing hidden there. It's just. You know, listen and watch and pay attention. Yeah. Such good advice. Okay, back to the poem. Two stanzas here, stanzas eight and nine, they go together. A man is happy if he finds praise and friendship within himself. You can never be sure of where you stand in someone else's heart. A man is happy if he finds good advice within himself. Many men have received bad advice by trusting someone else. This is an interesting one, or I guess two stanzas. It harkens back to a very ancient idea that at least in the West, you see first and sort of most popularly from uh, Socrates in that know thyself. And and the reason why you have to know yourself is that you, you, one, you won't be able to be your own friend and you won't be able to support yourself when others are telling you what you're doing is dumb or saying they're basically tearing you down. It, if you watch it like enough, like news, and I don't really recommend that, but like if you, um, any like VH one behind the music or whatever, like, bands are always like yeah people thought we were dumb but we we're like we don't care we just we're gonna do our thing and then they go on and become big rock stars and then you know get into drugs and fall apart or whatever but it's actually kind of similar because they keep doing their own thing but they go a little too far in that direction but um but for here like it's that idea that you have to stay true to who you are and you have you have to know who you are to be true to that because you can't you can't always trust other people and you can't trust their advice as we see in the, the second stanza. You don't know that they actually want your happiness and your, their, and your success. I would say in life, there are very few people who genuinely want you to succeed. And that's sort of how you can tell your friends from just people is that your friends are genuinely happy when you succeed because they see your success as their own. You know, it, it, the high tide raises all boats kind of thing, right? But if you, 
but if you're always looking for that support and that praise and that advice from other people, what you get is not going to be good for you. And it, it, it won't, it's not going to help you in the long run. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree. The, uh, this one has has a lot to it, a lot of layers to it. Uh, I, I like the idea, uh, essentially, that y- you know you should first of all ignore not ignore, but you know not uh, go off of. I think overly negative criticisms. I think what what more this is this is getting at here the opinions of others in general. Like I mean, you know those bands, something like that. I mean, you know if they just had some some people supportive around them, I'm, I'm sure that's that was enough to to kind of get off the ground there. And, uh, it, it, it's really just a call to, to trust yourself. And if, if you believe that you're aiming for the right thing on the right track, that you should go for it. Um, irres- irrespective of what others necessarily think. And, uh, definitely it's, uh, it, it's, it's descriptive of how other people are. Right. It, it, it's not like, everyone's advice is going to be bad and 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 certainly previously here it's it's you should listen and you should absorb information but then i think the the idea here is that you should take that information and make your own decision about it it should not be blindly following the advice or the instructions of someone else if uh if you you know a a common one i think that that um is the idea of a, of a bad order in the army, something like that. You know, if, if, uh, if you were to get a, a bad order, something that you think would, uh, result in people dying or something like that, just to get, you know, serious about it. Uh, it's, it's the, it's technically the responsibility of that person to say no and that's to, right. and to make it known why that they don't believe that's correct. And of course the people above them could just go say, okay, no, do it or you're fired. But, uh, you know, maybe that's a case where you have to stand by your convictions, but, uh, no, it, it, it's, it's interesting that this is tied to the last, the last section, you know, where it's all about listening to others and that's how you get wiser, but then it pretty much just says, make your own choice. That's not necessarily saying, in fact, I don't think it's saying make your own bad decision, you know, but make an informed decision yourself. Highly individual, right? Like it's definitely it's something that is is very very much um, putting the putting the onus on each individual to take responsibility as well and make their own decision there. So it's um, it's a it's a big big uh, section with a lot of layers. For sure, it it struck me. Um just one other thing uh, that I've got written here uh, about these two is basically follow, follow your gut and your intuition. And I, I think I don't, I haven't seen an instance where they, they steer you wrong. So, and, and I think that that's part of that too, is follow, follow your own intuition and your gut. Um, something else I'm, I'm noticing is that because you, you mentioned how individualistic this all is. It, it, I find that very interesting because it, it's a tribal society that they're living in, but they're at some point they realize that the health of the tribe depended on the health of the individual. So here's all these ways that the individual will make the tribe stronger because they're stronger themselves. And I, I think there's sort of a, a false dichotomy these days that, you know, individualism or, you know, evil collectivism. I guess evil individualism or evil collectivism. It's like, well, no, they actually go, they feed into each other if done properly. Uh, yeah. And I yeah. think we're seeing the sort of a, a way that it's done properly, or at least in a more proper, as good as you can get kind of thing. Sure. No, it's a great point there. Um, maybe, maybe just the last couple of, um, couple of things that, that I saw here is, is just maybe a, maybe this is a, a restating of, of what you said there, but, you, know, you should do things for your own self fulfillment. It, it's it's not for other people. You know, if, if you're doing things to impress other people, 
you know, you're not doing it for the right reasons, in, in my opinion. And I'll, and I'll say that, you know, it's my opinion, but I think that's meted out here directly. And, and, and it's like, if you do something for yourself, I think you'll get much more out of it because you're not listening to this negative criticism. Like, that's, that's not going to matter to you nearly as much, you know, okay, if, if someone criticizes you, they're not the person who you care about, right? Who, 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 uh, um, you're not, that's not who you're doing it for. You're doing it for yourself. But, but then if you, if you get, you know, people propping you up and things like that, you know, then those are the people that you want to have around you and they're Definitely. really your friends. So, and just w- when you talk about self-fulfillment, you're not talking about like that sort of airy fairy, like, um, I can't even think of it now because I've <laughs> been reading too much about actual like fulfillment where it's, you're aiming for the highest good for yourself but it also has to be the highest good for your family and it also has to be the highest good for society around you and all that kind of stuff like it isn't like i don't even know what kind of example to use but you know what what i i mean i i think i think you, you got it right there though it's it's like uh no matter what you're doing if you're always thinking could i be doing something better you, you know uh, there there's a time to to go relax and watch some reality TV because you're just burnt out. There's a time for that. I know people who would say that there's never a time for that, but you know, maybe they need to just relax <laughs> for half an hour. Um, but, but no, if, if you're, if you're thinking that all the time, I mean, that that's going to be a good thing. I, I think this makes the distinction between, you know, doing what is popular and doing what is, is, uh, is meaningful. Do, yes. do what is meaningful, not what is expedient, I think is one of Jordan Peterson's 12 rules. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so maybe, maybe we can leave that right there. And, and actually I was going to bring up, uh, another of the 12 rules. Hey, we're, we're, we're not just <laughs> stealing his wisdom. It's, it's good. It's good stuff. We're finding parallels here. Uh, the idea is don't compare yourself with someone else today. Compare yourself to yourself yesterday. Right. So, oh. That's good. Not ours. Not ours. But it's a it's a good one, and I think that's that's here. It's it's you don't compare yourself to other people. Don't worry about the criticisms of other people. I, I mean, okay, if, <laughs> if you have the whole world telling you you're doing it wrong, sometimes they they have a point. Definitely. But uh, you, you know, if you if you have that one negative voice or, or whatever, it's like, but but you you believe you're still doing the right thing go make yourself better improve yourself don't compare yourself to other people just work on your own self-improvement and maybe that's a different maybe that's a better word for it is if you're going for your own improvement you're you're doing something that's going to make yourself better which is therefore going to make the situation better for your family right so it's really make it better on all levels all the way up that's absolutely uh great great little section here might be maybe my favorite that we that we're even going to cover today actually but uh we'll see (laughs) i think uh i think that's uh that's enough of of that section of two little verses there sure i'm sure we'll go back to some of those themes but back to the poem a traveler cannot bring a better burden on the road than plenty of wisdom It will prove better than money in an unfamiliar place. Wisdom is the comfort of the poor. A traveler cannot bring a better burden on the road than plenty of wisdom. And he can bring no worse a burden than too much alcohol. I just had a crazy idea. It's too late now, but because we're just starting the don't get drunk phase of the Havamal. And if I think if we took a shot every time they mentioned don't get drunk, we would within half an hour, we'd, we'd have to stop the podcast. We would, it would, yeah, we'd be destroyed. This section in particular, this section in particular. So here's an idea for, for all of you, uh, yeah. a, a drinking game, your second or third go through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first one. And actually, uh, if, if we're being honest, don't do that. No, don't do that. that. And we'll find out why. And we'll find out why. So, obviously, uh, wisdom is... It's 
invaluable. There's, you know, they're saying it's, you know, better than money. And that's because money can't buy yourself out of a whole bunch of situations. You know, um, let's say you're traveling on a road and, you know, you're between towns, but it's nighttime. Your, your money is not going to set a fire for you. But knowing how to build a fire will, you know, keep you safe at night and keep you warm. Um, and it, I mean, m- money is, is a very useful tool, but wisdom will let you make more money. It will let you uh, deal with situations that money has no bearing on. And it, it's just, you can keep, you, you can use wisdom again and again and again, whereas money will eventually run out. And that's, I think, part of what they're saying here is that it's just wisdom has an infinite number of uses, whereas money has a few. And although important uses, it's not, it's not everything. I mean, you could think of money as an abstraction of bottled wisdom. And, and for sure, bear with me. The idea of, of currency is really uh, to take away the, the barter system. You, you know, you don't have to deal directly with the guy who is butchering your meat. You can, uh, you know, you, the guy raising the goat or whatever. You, you can deal with, you know, a butcher or someone else along the line to get your meat or a supermarket or something like that. And But you can trade a commonly agreed upon currency is literally the the word but but how do you get money wisdom wisdom Uh, you get money by having a skill having a trade which would have fallen i believe under the definition of of wisdom that was used by the germanic peoples the the norse peoples It, it, it covered so many things it wasn't just you, you know, the the idea of having common sense or specific knowledge, but also the ability to have a, a skill and a trade and something valuable worth trading, right? And so money, I mean, it, it's something that's going to come and go. And it, it really, it has one method of coming in, that's you doing things that people find useful. And then it only works one time. You trade it once for some good or service and then it's gone and then you have to get more money and it's it's you know you you can debate the merits of capitalism some other way but i i mean i i think they're they're certainly saying that uh you know there is something more important overarching than money it's not just about money and i mean this could be a you could you could take this as so, sort of an anti greed thing like like something like you you shouldn't it shouldn't be just about obtaining money obtaining um currency whatever it shouldn't be just about that and and wisdom should should go on top of that uh, there there is there's plenty of uh of value for wanting to to get money because it's going to lead to other things and and whatnot and and climbing up the dominance hierarchy and and whatever so i i I don't think this is well oh okay and and here's another thing just by the 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 fact that they mentioned money this is by nature a a capitalist society essentially not what we'd think of you you know modern laissez-faire john milton and all of that right but it's it's uh um it's still the idea that you trade currency for or gold or valuables or whatever for services and so that existed way back then but you know it's only going to get you so far really i I think this is all just saying you need to use common sense that's actually the the wording that larrington uses street smarts is another way to think about that like i mean if if you fall into a, a rough situation and you need to get yourself out safely you know it's possible that if you throw down all the money in your pockets that that's and then just run away that that's going to get you out of there safely but also possibly not depending on what type of situation it is you're much better off to have avoided the situation if you if you could see like this reminds me of a time actually uh i was at like a a fair with some friends and some of the some of the people wanted to go on a ride so the, the girls left their purses people were leaving their purses like on the on the side of the ride kind of thing. And everyone was doing it. It was, that was fairly safe. But then I saw uh, a bunch of people like, and these were not like, uh, 
you know, safe looking people, let's say they were, um, they were together in like a group and they were, I could hear them talking about getting ready to attack someone who was on the ride. So I grabbed the purses and sort of went away so that my friends would have to come follow me to that place to get away from everything. But it's sort of that idea, like money wouldn't have helped in that situation. It was see, understanding my surroundings being like, Oh, something's about to go down and something did. There was a big fight, but we were able to get out, uh, we were able to not be involved in it whatsoever. So it was, uh, but it's sort of that idea that money wasn't going to help in that situation. It was street smarts or whatever. Yeah. No, it, it, great story. Yeah. It's uh, really, I, I, I wouldn't take this as being somehow anti-capitalist or anything no, like that. I wouldn't. No, that's not, I, I don't think there's any meaning. Like they don't have that meaning there. I don't think it's, it's just, it's just making sure you know what the value, what what the actual value of money is. Um, the other thing, and I think I just realized this, and this, you know, maybe I'm just late to the game, but we, we talk about the trades and wisdom. I just made the connection that they're called, maybe they're called the trades because it's the service that you're trading. Jeez. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Good where one. have I been? Jeez. <laughs> um, no, uh, really the idea is just that it's what should always be a little more valuable, not a little, what should always be more valuable than money is is wisdom. And I, and I think that's uh, very, that's that's just such a common thing. Here. Definitely. Then we're switching gears. Yes. And this is going to be the beginning of um, the perils of over drinking. Um, so, I mean... Uh, <laughs> we could start into that now, but we're going to have, we have a good few stanzas that are going to make that abundantly clear his ideas on drinking. So I'm, I'm okay to move on actually. If, if, if you, yes, yeah, so let, let's move on so that we can hit alcohol with like, cause it's going to be the next few and we'll just be repeating ourselves. So let's, yeah, let's, let's get a good chunk of alcohol to talk about. I think so. Actually going to be doing three stanzas at once here. So 12, 13 and 14. For those counting. Back to the poem. There is not as much good as men claim there is in alcohol for one's well-being. A man knows less as he drinks more and loses more and more of his wisdom. It's as if a memory-stealing bird flies overhead while you drink and steals your mind away. I myself have been trapped in that bird's feathers when I drank at Gunlaw's house, home, sorry. I was drunk. I was too drunk at Fjaller's house. The best kind of feast is the one you go home from with all your wits about you. So. All right. So. I guess we, we will actually talk about the the dangers of alcohol in that it does it lowers your inhibitions it uh, it lowers your uh, your capability for motor skills um, what else it fogs your brain if I knew more about brain chemistry I'd go into exactly how it works I think it touched it interacts with the opioid receptors or something and um, and part of the problem is that it feels good, so you're more likely to drink more until it doesn't feel good. Um, so we'll talk about we'll talk about you know drinking while you're traveling. Not good because you need your wits about you when you're in the unknown. So that's a that's a pretty easy one to uh, get your head around. The um, yeah, unfortunately, I, we're between two pages here, so yeah. lots of flipping, but. I love the idea of it being a memory stealing bird. That's a, that's a great one. And um, it's funny too, because one of Odin's birds is actually memory. I think Munin, Munin. Yeah. yeah. So th there is a, there is kind of a theme of birds stealing thoughts and things like that, 
we're, we're dealing in thought. And so we've got one that is willing to uh, steal your memories, which, which is a pretty awesome uh, visual. And so I'll go with uh, verse 13, because, continuing with the, uh, the bird. He's talking about when he was drinking at uh, Gunloth's home. And Gunloth is the, uh, the giantess that um, one of the giants has, uh, has his daughter Gunloth guard Odin from stealing the, um, the mead of poetry. And I can't think of the name Od- Odriar. Odriar. Yes, that's it. Yeah. And so Odin uh, sort of has to convince her to give it, and he. Well, we actually get into that story in in the Havamal. It's very interesting. I'm not going to spoil anything here, but I th- I do think it's very worth noting that uh, Gunloth, the name means uh, invitation to battle, and. When I found that out, all I could think of was all the times I'd gone out to, you know, a bar with friends and seen men get, you know, ridiculously drunk. Women, too, actually, because, you know, they have their part to play in it as well. Uh, (laughs) No one gets away here free. (laughs) And uh, so the name means battle invitation. Well, how often do you see drunk men and women fighting over women? It Like, that's a pretty common common occurrence and so i think it's brilliant that the name is battle invitation because you drink so much and then plus there's like there are certain drinks that are known to uh instigate fights as well like uh i think jagger is a (laughs) (laughs) get jagger drunk and you're gonna fight or you know jack daniels is also good so i've heard uh for you know to get you in the mood for fighting and why wouldn't you want to fight over a woman as a man and and for women, I mean, I have also seen women getting drunk and pitting men against each other for, you know, for their affection. Like it's, it's a pretty common, uh, one of the more common things when drinking occurs, this is stuff that happens, especially with like young, young guys, young women who are, uh, you know, full of hormones and looking for something to do on a Saturday night. So I, I really enjoyed that. I thought, you know, they hit the nail on the head there. And then uh, when he talks about being at uh, Fjallar's house, Fjallar is a, a dwarf, and they actually um, we will see in some of the uh, later stories that Fjallar and his uh, brother, whose name escapes me right now, they, um, they kill one of the Aesir and make them eat a poetry out of his blood. And that a story for another time. Kvasir. Pardon? Kvasir. Yes. Uh, but uh, Fjallar's name means uh, hider or deceiver. And I think we've all, well, maybe not all of us, but it's pretty easy to lose things and be deceived when you are very drunk, when you are too drunk. <laughs> and then it, it ends with, you know, the best kind of feast is one that you can go home from with your wits about you. So, and we, we talked about a bit about it already, that the meat of poetry is that they're not saying don't drink. That That's not what they're saying at all. It's, they're saying don't get obliterated, which is funny because if you think of Vikings, they have this reputation for being like, just like gluttons and mon like they just drink everything in sight, but if we go by this, I don't think at least the, the standards of the community was don't do that. So, well, yeah, maybe, maybe they actually had a problem with that. Yeah. And, uh, that's why they made the rule. <laughs> that's exactly. probably it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, um, well, I, I think it's, it's, it's accurate to say that I don't think most people would go in thinking that Odin you know, top Viking God would be encouraging people not to drink so much as much as he does. But yeah, like, uh, there is not as much good as men claim there is in alcohol for one's well being. pretty straightforward. Uh, but, but then he goes into specific examples, right? And I actually really liked that he's owning his mistakes, noting, noting occasions, taking responsibility. He's to blame for his drinking 
right? So, so I mean, again, I mean, if we're if we're taking the character of Odin as what he is, the creator of the world and whatnot, uh, the the eternal seeker of knowledge and wisdom, he still screws up. He still goes and drinks too much, and he has to own up to it. And and I think that is first of all humbling. That's sort of what that says to me is that the only way to get past your mistakes is to take ownership definitely responsibility but it's it's also just that anyone can make mistakes right so so that's also just leveling it's it's not like it's not like these gods are just these shining examples balder maybe but are are these shining examples of perfection they're much more like real people who have real concerns and life experiences that are more relatable. And so, I mean, that's something that I really, really like. But if we're if we're getting through just on the the ideas here about alcohol, it's definitely a call to not drink too much. And maybe also if you do, like own up to it and maybe take uh, take stock of yourself maybe don't do that again or as often or <laughs> <Yeah>. something <laughs> like i mean baby steps right if you're uh, um if you're someone who gets uh, a little bit uh, a little bit overly drunk a little too often maybe just try cutting back or something like that then there's the that's not to get into you know people who actually like need alcoholism and all that kind of, yeah 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 although I think it's also worth noting about Odin that the only thing Odin consumes is mead. So again, this isn't about not drinking. It's just about not overindulging. And I think you're totally right that <laughs> it was a problem. So they had to figure out what to do about it. Yeah, possibly. There's a, I think there's also a pretty, pretty darn good uh, call not to drive drunk as well. If we're bringing it into the, the practical modern sense, you know, the best kind of feast is the one you can go home from with all your wits. Oh, about for you. sure. I mean, get home safely. I don't, that, that's not the only nuance to that sentence, but it's, it's definitely uh, a call to responsibility and getting home safe and not endangering others. I for think sure. that's, that's darn well accurate here. So just to bring things into the modern day, don't drink and drive. I think that's something we can all agree on. Yes. Uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna hit more about alcohol. So I think we're good to move yeah, on. I think we're good to go. Yeah. Back to the poem. A noble man should be silent, thoughtful, and bold in battle. But every man should also be cheerful and happy till the inevitable day of death. Kind of a turn from partying and then, you know. You're going to die. But this to me says, you know, don't speak, don't speak needlessly. Uh, be brave. So again, go out into the world. Don't, don't hang back. And the fact of the matter is we're all going to die. So you might as well enjoy this life that you're living because you're going to, it's, it's going to end one day. And Something I, I noticed in this, and it's not really, uh, it's more of an observation than something I can talk at length about is uh, there is an idea of reincarnation and sort of cyclical, like you, you'll come back in Norse mythology. It doesn't get addressed here, but I do think it's interesting that even with the, that idea, it's enjoy this life that you're living right now. Don't, you know, live in the moment. Don't be thinking about the future, all that, like way off in the future. Obviously there is like, you know, be preparation is thinking about the future, but it's, you know, enjoy the time that you have and, you know, be bold and don't, don't just spout off about everything, you know? Uh, agreed. It, the, the idea of reincarnation, I mean, it, it's not like they had an idea that was reincarnation that, that we understand it in the, in the West via the East. I, I mean, it, it's, same culture group way way back in the day but uh 
the idea, the Eastern idea, the Indian idea of of uh, reincarnation is is quite different from for sure from this one. But cyclical time and and whatnot. So the the inevitable day of death. I mean, that's it's quite final for you, for sure. For <laughs> yes, for for the individual, absolutely for the individual. Yes, but uh, no, it, it's more about uh, this. This stands as more into being silent thoughtful you know listen more about paying attention right it's it's just going through these same themes over and over because you can't you can't say them too much right but i like the idea of being bold in battle i think what that says is also the idea of being competent and capable because i mean you could foolishly rush into battle with no experience, no training, and promptly get killed. Right away. Right away. Yep. You, you could. And be of no use to anyone. No use. No. So I, I think that I think it implies competency in not necessarily just martial arts, which you know any form like shooting a gun is a martial art. It, it, it's not just the you know Japanese wearing a gi sort of things but uh it's 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 capability the the ability to turn into a monster if you need to i think that's what that is you're you are capable of defending yourself your family and but but only if you if you need to because i i love that the other side of this is be cheerful and happy so i I think i mean it's a it's a call to enjoy life when you you can because sometimes you're going to need to be bold in battle you're sometimes you are going to have to let the monster out or you or you have to struggle right so it's this is a good very balanced verse i think i think so too yeah um shall we yes because it actually really sort of ties nicely into this Mm -hmm. back to the poem an unwise man thinks he'll live forever if only he can avoid a fight. But old age will give him no peace, even if weapons do. I like this one. It uh, there's a there's a lot to say about this, but the first thing that uh, that I thought of when uh, when I read this was. When I was really little, I was playing with a, I was playing checkers with a friend, and in checkers, there's a rule that if you have an opportunity to to jump the other player, you you have to do it. But we didn't do that, and we got to a point in the game where it was stuck, and we couldn't play anymore. And I think it this just really hit that home that if you think you can avoid conflict in your life, you're sorely mistaken. You're you may and you may be able to grow to, to old age, but like, what does it mean? All you've done is exist that long. You haven't done anything because living is conflict. So you haven't gone out into the unknown. You haven't gained wisdom. You haven't stood for anything. You haven't fought against anything. There's, you've just sort of been taking up space. And when you're, you know, when you're in your old age or, and you're looking back at your life, Will you find any solace in that, that you didn't, you never stood for anything or did anything with your life? And the answer is no, you're not, you're not, you'll be old and have survived long, but, but for what, for like, there's, it's hollow. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, exactly. I I mean, back in the first few stanzas, I mean, it's, 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 this is more so of, of you have to put yourself out there. You have to go into battle. You have to take the risk because only through taking the risk is there any reward. And it, it's exactly right that if you don't take those risks, life is going to be meaningless. I, I mean, I, I I think that's why you can get people fall into depression so easily through, you know, maybe, maybe unemployment or something like that. And, you, and you're just staying at home feeling sorry for yourself. And that can just be a vicious cycle because it's, it's like, then you, then you continue not putting yourself out there and getting nothing out of it. Then you continue to feel bad, worse, worse, worse. There's actually stanzas later that directly like talk about that. Yeah. So it's, uh, 
just more of the refrain of you have to put yourself out there, go into the unknown. I think it also talks or points to being able to fight and not being harmless. Uh, and if you, again, watch Jordan Peterson, he talks about this frequently, that you don't you don't want to be harmless you want to have you want to have an edge to you that you can use when needed and i know uh so in in the christian religion there's a, a call or a the lesson that you know uh, blessed are the meek and it's been i don't know enough about it I, i've seen some interpretations of it as uh, the meek being people who are able to fight but choose not to. But I've also seen a lot of just, you know, being meek and that meek and mild like a lamb so that so you'll be blessed, I guess, is the the, the lesson there. But what this is this is definitely not saying that. It's saying you you need to fight. You and you need to be able to fight if you want to do anything worthwhile and that you know, don't be harmless. Have a have access to the monster within you so that when you need it, it's there, but you're not over, not overwhelmed by it. You can, you can control it so that you're not just, you know, a, a raging lunatic burning everything in sight. It's, you can take it out when you need it and then put it back when it's not needed. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, honestly, there's, there's a lot of ways to fight these days. It's not just life or death, even, even though in, in general, uh, it's a good thing to be able to handle yourself in, in life or death situations. Yeah, in general, that's good. <laughs> but but it's also fighting for, you know, what, what you believe you you deserve, right? You, you can't you can't do that without actually going out and doing the thing. You know, it's climbing dominance hierarchies. It's having a job. It's uh, fighting for the well-being of yourself and your family. It's th there's different ways to do it. Not just literally life and death, but it's in all things you have to you have to fight for everything worthwhile. If if it's if you don't have to fight for something, it's it's probably not going to give you a great reward, right? So no, that's sure. that's what this is saying. I think. Definitely. So I think we can move on. I think so. Back to the poem. A foolish man misuses his mouth. He talks too much. Or says nothing. As soon as he gets a drink, he'll say anything he knows. Well, I think we've all seen this guy who gets a few drinks into him and then just won't shut up. Oh, so annoying. And apparently they had them back then too. <laughs> apparently, yeah. The And there's, there's some real dangers too. So not only, is it, like, yes, it's annoying, but misusing their mouth if they're saying insulting things that will have re like real world consequences after that's a, a thing to watch out for uh even insulting someone and getting into a fight especially if you know you're drunk and they aren't that's not good for you and and then also like if you divulge too much information that might be sensitive to people you know that can be used against you, things that you wouldn't necessarily want other people to know, but you get a few drinks into you and you, you spill your guts, well, that can be used against you. So just very practical advice about, again, you know, don't drink to the point where you're making bad decisions that are going to affect you uh, later on when, you know, when you're, when you've sobered up and make you run your mouth. So, well, and another side of it too, it specifies that it's a foolish man who misuses his mouth. So, again, it puts it back onto the individual here. Alcohol certainly enhances it, but it's the foolish person that that has this uh, that has this issue, right? So, so it, it's to me, this just throws the responsibility back onto the individual again, as per usual here. Don't blame the alcohol for this. You know, either you're foolish for having alcohol to begin with, if you know this is how it affects you, <laughs> right? Or, or it's just you know, in general, you're the type of person that is primed and ready to go if you have a drink, and so, 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 
dual things. You know, you, you, you should in general not be willing to divulge so much like we saw in previous verses, right? But, you know, if you are that type of person, maybe avoid alcohol. That's yep. Try not to be that type of person and maybe try and not drink so much. That's the kind of dual lessons here, I think. I think you're right. So, back to the poem. Only a man who is wide traveled and has wandered far can know something about how, how other men think. Such a man is wise. So once again, we see the idea of wisdom coming from traveling and wandering sort of far and wide and that you have to, it's not good enough to maybe read about, you know, other people or that kind of thing. You, you actually have to experience it to be able to see what, uh, just sort of see what happens in the world so that if you meet someone and they behave in a certain way and do certain things, the next time you meet someone who behaves in a similar way, you can, you can kind of play it out in your head and be like, oh, okay, this is one of the likely scenarios that will happen as a consequence of how they're acting. And again, you, you just don't get that if you are, if you stay in your house and in what you know, you have, you have to go out outside of your comfort zone, outside of the known to find the stuff. Absolutely. Well, and it just emphasizes the importance of this experience. I mean, since all this stuff is kind of getting repeated, 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 it's, it's, it's a lot of finding the nuance to each individual verse. And in this one, I think it's, it's really the, the idea that wisdom comes from experience. And I mean, that's the biggest reason why you guys shouldn't be listening to me at all, but, uh, <laughs> I'm still pretty little, but, uh, and thank you by the way for, for, for tuning in. But, uh, no, it's, it's the importance of, of learning as much as you can by traveling widely. And as you gain that knowledge, you'll know something about other, other people. And, you know, having that just come through experience, it's, uh, you know, it's a good point, but it, it's really more like you have to, you have to do a lot. Like you're not going to know everything quickly. It's not like you're just going to put yourself out there, going to the unknown real quick and oh, going to get this wisdom back. It's, it's through doing it over and over and over being in situations over and over and over that you'll eventually get comfortable and competent and knowledgeable. That's my takeaway here. So definitely. And I, I like what you said about having to do it over and, and it's not an immediate thing. And the, what, what I was thinking about when you said that was actually uh, the Voluspa and, and sort of Ragnarok in that, you know, if, if you go into a new situation, the you that comes out of it will be totally different. And if you're, if you go in willingly, it's a much easier transition than if you're going in fighting it. So, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's just, you're a different person when you come back from learning things and sometimes it's not too painful. Other times it's incredibly painful and you know, the world ends and all the gods die and you get reborn out of the underworld, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, taken to the most extreme yeah. scenario. Yeah, 100%. Um, and, and one other little nuance here that I, I liked was just that it's a you, you're knowing something about how other men think. So, I mean, that shows the value of, uh, I, I think, for lack of a better term, empathy, being able to understand how the person around, how the people around you are actually thinking and, and, and I mean that could be through some you know general knowledge of human psychology that comes through reading about it and experiencing it and blah 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 but, it, but I think you, you go down to the low level of you know if you're dealing with the individual people that's you know getting to know them and getting to know getting to know them well enough to understand how they're reacting what that might mean for how they're feeling and for how they're uh possibly going to react to what you might do right so it's it's very much uh if it's not just getting to know someone it's at least getting to know enough people that you can tell when something's off about someone something like that i would agree and i was just thinking a great example of this is um the the podcast with uh jocko willink and jordan peterson uh which 
highly recommend you check out. It's one of the Jocko Willing podcast is a great podcast, and one of the best episodes is his episode with Jordan Peterson. The first one, uh, episode ninety eight. There you go. Yeah, it uh, it you have two men who have sort of wandered wide and far, doing different things, but who come to the same conclusions, and they both know how other men think, and it's it. Yeah, this this stanza really just clarifies that crystallizes it yeah yeah it, for completely different reasons completely different backgrounds but their advice to people is basically identical basically yeah just it's amazing coming from different perspectives so highly recommend um jocko willink in general get yourself motivated through, for sure through him but also that particular interview shall we move on let's do it back to the poem don't hold on to the mead horn but drink your fair share. Say something useful or stay quiet. And no one else will judge you poorly if you go to sleep early. Makes me think of that old uh, saying that early to bed, early to rise makes men healthy, wealthy, and wise. And I do like that it says, you know, don't hold on to the mead horn, but drink your fair share. And I, I take that to mean is that, you know, enjoy yourself, have a, have a good time. Just don't, don't overdo it. Um, and again, say something useful or stay quiet. Just make sure that you're, that you're precise with your words and that you're not speaking for no reason, just to hear yourself speak. It's another annoying drunk person is the one who just, you know, we talked about it earlier, they just don't shut up and you can't get a word in edgewise. So, you know, don't be that person. And then when you're done, you're done, go home and go to sleep early and get up the next day feeling good. I like all of this. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's a, it's a great, uh, great verse, a call to moderation at the end of the day, but many calls to moderation in here. What I like about this one, a few things actually. So don't hold on to the horn, drink your fair share. So, so I take a, I can look at it also from the, from the other side of it. Don't hog it, you know, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, if it's, if it's, you know, a shared communal thing, you know, don't, don't take, and this can, this can apply anywhere actually. Like don't, don't take too much. Don't take more than what's reasonable. Right. Yeah. You know, maybe you're a bigger person and you need to eat more or drink more or something like that. And that's fine, whatever. But you, you know, I, I think it, uh, you can think of someone who eats half the pizza that's supposed yeah. to be for four people or something like that. I mean, that's, that's just not, not very, very nice. But, uh, so, so there's that one. And then the, the other side of it, you know, if you, if you need, if you need to leave the party because you're like, no, 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 I'm done. You know, a actually someone might judge you poorly for that. You know, you might get bad peer pressure here people no 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 stay out have some more drinks something like that and it's like i, I think here you got you got to stand your ground on that and be like no 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 i'm i'm done like i need to i need to go home i need to go to sleep and uh so so i mean just just from the practical example that you, you know people may actually look like they're judging you poorly something like that it's you know through peer pressure or whatever it's it's just try to avoid that is is maybe the 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 message here try and avoid people who are going to be like that who are who are just gonna try and keep you out and doing these these things and you know you you know you got a good group of friends if they are completely fine with you uh calling it a night earlier for than sure them, so Plus, it's hard for them to judge you the next morning when they are hungover and throwing up and really don't want to be alive and you're fine. So yep. just remember that, that. Couldn't agree more. And on to verses about the person who eats half the pizza that's meant for four people. Absolutely. Good segue. Back to the poem. Two verses this time, 20 and 21. A gluttonous man, unless he watches himself will eat to his own detriment. Wise men will often ridicule a fool on account of his belly. Even cows know when they should go home and leave behind the fields. 
but an unwise man does not know the measure of his own appetite. I like that, especially, uh, I think you put the right emphasis on even cows. <laughs> um, so obviously this is saying don't, don't eat too much that there, there's a detriment to that. Uh, and really that it should come as no surprise as we've gone along it, this, most of this has been a call to moderation. So why would it be any different with food? And especially in this day and age where a lot of the food that we eat is only food because we call it food and not actually like, like they were eating things that was actually like they killed a cow, they ate the cow, you know, it, they didn't, but it wasn't processed and, you know, filled with chemicals to make it, you know, last for six months kind of thing. Like, so there's, but even then there, there was a, there was a tendency to overindulge and, you know, and, and get fat and soft. And I mean, this is in no way like, you know, I'm a modern man. I'm a little soft around the edges. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not hungry. We're patting our tummies. Yeah. <laughs> for those of you listening. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important not to, to fall into gluttony. It's probably why it's, a you know, also a, a deadly sin in Christianity and you know there there are prohibitions against it in a whole bunch of other religions that it's looked down upon for sure and it, it's just really uh, a matter of over overindulgence and in some ways like greed and it, it can harm the community because you're, you're taking more than your fair share and you're harming yourself so that if the community needs you you're not um, you're not as able to take care of what needs to be done or take care of your responsibilities. So it's a good point. No, I, I mean, <laughs> there's a fantastic couple of verses here. Uh, I mean, I think it's just a commentary on our, on our current Western culture that, you know, there's, there's such a, a, a movement for normalizing. Maybe that's too strong of a word, but, but at the, at the very least the, the acceptance of, of being overweight as a, as a thing that's okay and, and I don't think that's right. It's it's fine to, uh, you know, there's plenty of good people who are who are overweight, and it's perfectly fine to just be friends with them. There's there's oh, yeah. there's nothing saying don't be friends with a, a glutton or anything like that. But it's also it's also just a thing of you know maybe that's not the best way to be, and maybe you should in fact try not to have that be your state of being for sure. And there, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you, you know, some, some gentle prodding in the right direction of, and, and you, you know, you can point to this, you can point to, well, so many different religions and traditions who say, do not be a glutton. And mm -hmm. there's gotta be something to that. If you know, that's a common thread through so many things. For sure. It, it it's kind of like saying it's a, it's a suboptimal way of, of existing, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make you like, it's not a, a, I guess there is a bit of a moral judgment here, but it's not, you're not necessarily like a terrible person. Um, and, the, and they don't, they don't, uh, have it like that in the, in the poem. It's just that it's a suboptimal way of being and moderation is, is a, a the more optimal way. Yeah, I mean, they're saying it's an unwise man who doesn't know the measure of his own appetite. And I mean, that's 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 fine. I mean, that's not being wise here in this poem is meant to be negative for sure. But that's that's also not necessarily like you are a bad person. It's just maybe try not to do that. Yeah. I, I mean, um, th this is also coming from a culture where food was scarce. It's not like people in Viking age Scandinavia had it all. I, uh, like, I mean, incredibly harsh weather, living conditions, hard to grow crops. Even today, really, it's not fantastic farmland or anything like that. And not a lot of room for, uh, for livestock, agriculture, anything like that. So, I mean, they eating when you could was, I'm sure, a good thing. But then it's also the idea of don't overdo it. I mean, that's that's fantastic. That's fantastic that there can be that self-awareness of even though it's so hard to have 
to have food, you know, if there's an overabundance of it, you know, okay, maybe if there's an overabundance of it, let's not eat so much and actually save some for the future. I mean, that's, that's the other side of it, right? That's like, if you, if you have enough that you can eat enough to make yourself overweight, maybe you should have saved some of that for, sure. for later. And, and you'd have more resources in general after that point. But the other thing I was, I was just thinking this, um, like how we're talking about alcohol and I, I don't know how true this is, but there's always those myths around like uh, Vikings in particular eating so much and throwing up and then eating more. Um, if there's any truth to that, this may have been the, you know, the injunction against that, like, Hey, you know, you could not do that. Sven, come on. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we have to make a rule just for you, Sven. Yeah. No, um, well, and you know, what's funny is that, um, in Africa, a lot of cultures, it was, you know, a sign of wealth and status to get overweight for sure, because that meant you had enough, enough food, but you know, maybe that's a case of they could have saved some of that food, distributed, yeah. distributed it a little bit better in the village or something like that. So it's, it's just a, a different perspective. So for sure. I like this one a lot. Definitely. Uh, just the fact that it talks about moderation and I also like that it's it's got parallels in other traditions. I mean it's it's not like the the Vikings and Odin are the only ones who are carrying a torch for not being a glutton. Yeah. <laughs> so something to just to, to keep in mind as someone living in today's society. And again, yeah. my belly uh, could use a little trimming, so through discipline. So Back to the poem. A stupid man and an undisciplined one laughs at everything. He hasn't learned a lesson that would do him good. He himself isn't flawless. So I looked at uh, this one and then I also looked at Larrington and Larrington has more of a... Uh, laughing at everything in a, in a, like they ma they're making fun of people t type of way. And w which is what you get, uh, a learning a lesson that would do him good. He himself isn't flawless. So it's that person that is constantly ragging on other people. And there's sort of a way to like make fun of people. That's, that's jovial and funny. And like it, it, it builds camaraderie. And then there's a way to do it to like, really like, tear someone down and they're talking about tearing someone down and because they haven't realized that, you know, they aren't flawless themselves. And if they probably, if they were smart, they would realize that and then cut some slack for other people because when, uh, when their flaws are going to be pointed out, they're going to come for them and, you know, really, uh, really break them down. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a good point is that, is that, um, you know, if you, if you criticize others this much, you you leave them openings, and, and, and I mean, it's it's not going to be, it's not going to be in fun at that point because you have injured some other person. They are going to, you know, want to point out all all your flaws. I, I mean, the the best example, really, I think, is you know the parable that uh, that Jesus told. You, you know, of, of the person who is worried about the speck in his brother's eye when he in fact had a plank in, yeah. in, in his own. Right. And so, and so it's like, set your house in perfect order before criticizing others. Right. So that's uh, another rule guys. Yeah. Um, we should have a, a counter like Jordan Peterson rules. Oh, here's another one. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the other drinking game guys. Yeah. <laughs> Except don't. Again. We don't want to be responsible for any alcohol poisoning. No. Uh, and, and I guess as goes, we've learned, <laughs> we wouldn't be responsible for it. It would be you. So, uh, yeah. Goes completely counter to everything we've been talking about. So don't do that, guys. No, no but uh, okay, again, here, it's, it, it's really just don't criticize others because you, you have flaws yourself. For sure. And, like, don't be a jerk. It's... Uh, no one benefits from always ragging on someone in a, in a mean way. And it's not, it's not good on a, 
interpersonal level, but it's not good for the the tribe as a whole or the society because you're just building animosity and conflict. And especially when, you know, back in the day when you're trying to eke out a living, you, you don't need, you don't need to have uh, fights within the tribe because you're fighting the elements in nature enough that you're probably going to die anyway. Like you don't need to be fighting the battle internally as well. So it, I think it's really just a, an injunction to be like, don't be a jerk because you don't, <laughs> you don't need it. And there are things about you that annoy people, but they are mature enough to let it go. True. And, and, and I mean, I, I think the, uh, the other point about that, uh, about the good of the, the group, right? It, there are some cases where it's good to provide constructive criticism. For sure. But it completely takes the legs out from under you. If you are telling someone, you you know, do as I say, not as I do sort of thing, completely takes the legs out from under you in that situation. Because if you're telling someone to do what you can't be bothered to, or that you have trouble with yourself, that doesn't look great. No. Right? So, it, uh, if at the very minimum you approach it with humility again. Again. And maybe you're... With the perfect self, uh, under- perf- with the self, with enough self understanding to say, "Hey, I have trouble with this too," but maybe it would be better for us all if we could just uh, both uh, try and improve ourselves in this way. That comes across a lot better than than saying, "Hey, for you're sure. you're just you're just useless and worthless." Ha ha ha. You always have been, always will be. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. And then they can fling that right back at you, and then there's a fight, and no one's happy. So, I think we can move on. Let's do it. Back to the poem. A fool stays awake all night, worrying about everything. He's fatigued when the morning comes, and his problems remain unsolved. This one hits hard, because I, I've i definitely been guilty of this, and it's so true. Like, you, you stay up worrying about something, usually something that's seems huge but isn't that huge but sometimes it is like sometimes it's it's a legitimate worry but then when you wake up in the morning the problem is still there but now you're also tired and so the likelihood that you're going to make a good decision on how to solve this problem has diminished greatly so it's just some like practical advice that if you're able to like when you're going to sleep just be like hey i can't there's nothing i can do about this right now it is you know I like to say it's a future Dan worry. Like I don't, I nothing I can do about it now. I'll worry about it tomorrow. So, yeah, it's uh, it's good advice. A lot easier said than done. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and and I think it's also not a not not to say that you shouldn't be thinking about the future or thinking about what's going on. But there's also a point where you realize you you know you this is just going to be overthinking it or over planning sure. or something like that. And then, then you just got to drop it until such time as you can act on the, the things that you think you need to improve. I, I mean, uh, I, I think CEOs the world over and, you know, just general self-help wisdom, right? Not, and whatnot is, is, is that, you know, a great thing to do is to think before you go to bed, think of the things you need to do the next day, maybe write them down even, then just go to bed. It's done. You've, it's done. You, you've taken inventory. You've thought about it. Then when you get up, you can look at that list or take inventory or whatever. Think of what you need to do that day. Then go do it. For sure. It's kind of like you, when you've made that list, you've, you've finished your thinking about it. You don't, because it's already set up for tomorrow. You can pick up right where you left off. You don't need to think about it anymore. And you're kind of giving yourself permission to forget about it because it's been dealt with. So that's, that's actually like a very practical way of, you know, following this. And again, this is in, you know, possibly thousand year old Viking wisdom. So it's got to have something to it. It, It's really just, you you know, don't, don't stress yourself out unnecessarily, right? Like that's, that's the underlying message, right? And I mean, there's, there's no value in, in thinking, 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 overthinking, and then doing nothing. And, and then that's your point as well about, about being too tired to do anything the next Definitely. day. Cause you 
thought stayed up late agonizing over something you can't do anything about right now right so it's yeah just good advice overall for sure so back to the poem two stanzas again this time 24 25 an unwise man thinks anyone who laughs with him is his friend he doesn't understand that the wise are mocking him even when he overhears them. An unwise man thinks anyone who laughs with him is his friend. But he won't find these friends when he goes to court. No one will speak on his behalf. This one's a sort of a cold slap of reality because just because you're hanging out with people and they laugh at your jokes and you have a good time with them doesn't mean that they are one doesn't mean that you, they're your good friends that they're going to be there when things are bad and it, actually we we talked a bit about that uh before and it it's sort of an, until you face one of these situations where they have they're given the option when things are rough to uh distance themselves you know whether they stay or get out of town that's sort of the that's sort of that's the litmus test right so i really see this as uh putting too much trust in people that that you have fun with because you you can have fun with people without having like a a tight uh, a tight bond with that that's not hard and and you, you do that you can do that all the time like if you play any sports, you might not be friends with everyone on the team, but you're having fun together and working together and that kind of thing. But it doesn't mean they're going to have your back when times are tough. So yeah, I think, again, it's a, another call to moderation in that don't, don't judge the quality of your relationship with someone by the amount of fun you have with them. That's a good point. And I, I, I mean, the, where I went with this was that you know, maybe maybe you're trying too hard to fit in, or you're you're trying sure. too hard to make jokes that, you know, maybe they they land sometimes, but oftentimes not so much necessarily. And that's and but the important part is how you you that's not how you get real friendships, and that's that's not how they they nope. stick around. And then the point about the point about um, going to court. So so literally, what they're talking about is the the concept of the the thing, which was the 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 way for all men in in a in a village or an area to get together and discuss important matters make decisions and and uh you know maybe if there if there's some some issue for for you right you're you're being brought up on some kind of a charge of maybe stealing something or, or whatever some some something less than murder because that's that's different but um you know, if other people spoke on behalf of your character and stuff like that, you know, that would be a, a way for uh, y- y- evidence enough that, you know, you wouldn't be the sort of person to to do that sort of thing. And, and I mean, in, in our society, like the, the parallels that we have, I think that's something something like when, when push comes to shove, who's going to really have your back? Right. So it might not necessarily be in a, in a court type situation, court of law, which, by the way, our legal system is directly descended from the, the Germanic concept yes. of of laws. English common laws is, is the is what underlies um, well, well, English law, but then American law, Canadian law, it's, it's for sure. It has they they may be quite different in practice, but they they share common roots and and uh, so English law is the cousin to Scandinavian law. They work basically the same way. So yeah, I think that's about all I have for for this part. Good enough. Back to the poem. A stupid man thinks he knows everything if he gets himself in a tough corner, but he doesn't even know what he'll answer if men ask him questions. This is one of those situations where you're talking to someone who acts as if they know absolutely everything about any given subject. And usually those types of people think they know everything about everything. And then you ask them usually like a specific question that 
how they answer will very clearly show everyone how much they actually know. And they don't have a clue like what to say. So it comes out as like, I think the term is baffle gab where they use big words and concepts and all this kind of stuff that actually mean nothing. And you're just like, okay, you know nothing about what you're talking about. Is it? It's fun to watch. It's not fun to be the person that's happening to because you, you get put into a corner and, and you feel it. You're like, oh crap, I'm, I'm caught. And the way to remedy this is humility again and understanding that you don't know everything. And we can actually go back to Socrates for this, uh, that, um, you know, the one thing Socrates knew is that he knew nothing. And so it opened, he was then open to learning everything he could. And it's sort of like this, where if you, if you don't know something freely admit it, because then you'll be able to learn. And that's, that's really the, the solution or the antidote to being the stupid man. Definitely. The Larrington translation paints a different perspective. So her wording is that the stupid man cowers in the corner so off on his own. So to me, that also says something to the effect of you might think, you know, a lot when you're by yourself, you know, who hasn't had the, the idea of, uh, the experience of, uh, you know, they, they get the perfect thing to say after a conversation, right. After they've had a little bit of time to think about it. Right. So it's, uh, to me, it's, this is, this also has not, not to say that, that, um, that interpretation isn't exactly right. You know, someone just blustering off, sure. right? But uh, it's also the, the case that, uh, you know, if, if you have someone who you think you know everything, if you're in your own head or off in your own corner, when it comes time to actually compare yourself to other people, maybe you actually know nothing. Definitely. And I, I think this is just part of the ongoing theme of just emphasizing knowledge in general and being able to keep up with the wise, you know, like it, like an ongoing self-fulfilling competition. If everyone is, is trying to, to get wiser, that's going to make things better for everyone. And, and actually that, I think that is something unique in that there, there were actually competitions, almost exactly. You would call it competitions to see who is the most wise. And it, it was a, a competition to well, we'll see that in the in the next poem actually about food and small um the it's it's just an emphasis on continually learning and pushing the standard and pushing yourself further so that in the situations where you find yourself with wise people you can hold your own on the things that you know about but then you can also learn something yourself and and i think easiest way to shut down the possibility of someone teaching you something is if you try and act like a know-it-all. Definitely. So I think this is a, a fantastic, uh, just uh, another, another nuanced way of saying that you, you should, you should know what you know, but you, you know, if, if you don't know something, just admit it freely and, and learn and listen, pay attention, all those things. Yeah, I think the, the big takeaway is humility. I think that's the, in a lot of these actually, is just be humble. And uh, that'll keep you open to learning. Because there's no, I've noticed there's nothing about, like you're stupid for not, you're stupid for not being wise because you haven't learned yet. It's It's like, it's like you're dumb if you have been given every opportunity to learn and you haven't. It's not, there's no admonition against like trying to learn. So it, the, there seems to be no go out and learn. It's, it's almost your duty to learn. And here's what happens if you don't. Well, yeah, I like that point. There, there's no admonition against trying to learn. But the flip side is, if you haven't taken the opportunity by putting yourself out there to learn, that's also bad. Yes, exactly. Like that's your own fault too. Yes. If you haven't put yourself out there for it. And, and I think the, the, the other nuance here is, is just a little bit of preparation and complacency that, that you, that you, if, if you just are going off of believing that you, you know enough to, you know, whatever handle some sort of situation, but you, you haven't actually gone and thought through the questions that people might, 
ask, right, then that's your own fault as well. So it's sure. continually puts it back on the individual, makes the, it's their, it's your own, each individual, individual's responsibility to learn, put themselves out there, grow, gain knowledge, all of the above. Yeah, it's sort of the, I would say if there's a theme through all of this, it's, it is your duty to, to better yourself. And the way you do that is through humility and moderation. And if you don't do this, then you're a stupid man or a foolish man or whatever. But I think that's the, cause that, that seems to be what it's, everything is orbiting around. Moderation and and humility. Yeah, and and it's important to note that maybe the moderation is explicit when it's yes, talking about definitely drinking and eating, eating and talking. Yeah, but humility is something where we're we're really just reading between the lines here, and but but it, it comes up consistently, and it, and that's really just. To say that it, it's it's a common thread, but also something that is nuanced. It's 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 something that you need to to understand to get there. But this this isn't saying it explicitly. At no. least it's not saying the words directly. No. So, but the idea of just listening and paying attention, being quiet, actually, and and we're only going to do one more stanza today. Uh, the next stanza is actually pretty good for that, for tying it yes. all together, hopefully. So back to the poem. It's best for a fool to keep his mouth shut among other people. No one will know he knows nothing if he says nothing. Ill-informed people are also the ones who don't know when to stop talking. So... With this one, the first thing I thought of was this uh, quote that has been attributed. I've heard it attributed to Lincoln, like Abraham Lincoln, uh, Mark Twain, and I think Winston Churchill. And that's, the, um, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Uh, they don't actually know who, who said it. Uh, it probably wasn't any of them, but uh, you can actually you can find these sentiments uh, throughout uh, popular culture as well as other religious writings, and um, and obviously in the, the Havamal here. I, I think I'm trying to remember where else I I saw it, but like Christianity had something about that in Proverbs. Uh, I think in Hinduism and Buddhism, Buddhism certainly there was something about it. Like it, it's a very it's a very common theme that if you don't know what you're talking about, just, you know, shut up. And, and you might, there, you, you always run that risk of, and I think that's what drives people to talk about things that they don't know. And I guess talk authoritatively about things that they don't know about is that worry that people are going to think they are dumb. And so then they open their mouth and people in the know, Yes, they absolutely know that. Okay, not only do they not know what they're talking about, they're now also insecure that they don't know, because the the easiest way to remedy this would just be, oh, I I didn't know that. Can you explain more to me? Done. Like you, you've now you, you've now participated, so people aren't thinking you're dumb. You asked a question to get more information. Again, people aren't going to think you're dumb. Like it's it. Uh, it's such a simple way to fix the situation, but I guess pride gets in the way and a lot of people try and make it look like they know what they're talking about. But yeah. Check your ego. Check your ego. Absolutely. All I'll add to that on that note is our obligatory, uh, please tell us if we're wrong. Oh, definitely. <laughs> we are not experts in any of this stuff. We're just, you know, thinking is about, about as much as is reasonable about this stuff here. And these are our ideas, what we've, what we've found from it. We're drawing parallels from people who know much more about what they're talking For about sure. than, than we know. And so 
I mean, that's why the constant references to, to Jordan Peterson. That's why I bring up Jocko Willink. Uh, Carl Jung. Carl yeah. Jung. All these great people. You know, hopefully we're uh, uh, we're getting something right here. But if we're wrong, we want to know about it. And we are happy to correct it, fix it, because we're by no means experts. So don't take the fact that we're talking for a really long time about this stuff as we we think we know what we're talking about. This is just the best we've been able to come up with after yeah. reading this stuff. And we're just trying to learn more about it too. So please uh, let us know where we're wrong. For sure. <laughs> and uh, I think with that, uh, we're, we're just stopping here for uh, reasons of time. Uh, we're actually figuring it'll be about six episodes to to do the whole Havamal. So the next episode, just so that we're not doing six in a row on this one thing, our next episode is going to be the poem Vafthrudnismal, which is the, the following poem, the third poem in the Poetic Edda. And uh, we're going to basically go with a pattern of uh, doing one verse, sorry, one episode on the Havamal, and then one episode on the the next poem up in the up in the list here. Uh, just to keep things interesting and have a, a good variety of uh, of stories to tell and talk about. And we'll get through the Havam all kind of as we go here. So we're, uh, we're stopping now just because uh, we've identified this as a pretty good place to stop. For sure. Well, we don't want to be one of those ill-informed people who do not know when to stop talking. Yeah. Look at that. What a good point there. <laughs> the, the poem's telling us to shut up. Um. If I were just we 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 have just pretty much recapped a lot of the ideas that were were present here, but uh, just uh, my little attempt at it, a uh, lot of emphasis on getting into the unknown. You know, the little interplay between host and guest was was interesting. Emphasis on hospitality, but it's also a an encounter with the unknown, and then a lot on humility and moderation like we talked about and and really just how to conduct yourself in a way that's going to help you gain more knowledge because if there is one singular idea that the Havamal is about I think it's that you should be trying to learn more gain knowledge and we'll see in sharp relief the idea that you have to make sacrifices to do that so yep I agree it's uh it's a, a guide on how to live your life and live a life that is going to benefit you, your family, and the tribe that you live in. And you do that through gaining wisdom, being proficient in what well, being pr- proficient in something, and uh, moderating your behavior, not being a jerk. So, yeah. That's it for today's episode. So we'll uh, we'll finish off by again uh, giving credit where credit is due. This is the Poetic Edda by Jackson Crawford. This is what we've been reading. Highly recommend that you check it out. Link to the book on Amazon is below. Both for uh, those of you on YouTube and uh, listening in the podcast, we've got it in the uh, the podcast description as well. And uh, so thank you to Jackson Crawford and Hackett Publishing. And as well, thank you to Dr. Jordan Peterson. The inspiration for this series was his biblical series of lectures. Fantastic series. Recommend you check it out. And we thought we could do the same thing with uh, a different tradition. So that's what we've been doing. And uh, links below to uh, some of his great videos on YouTube, as well as books that he recommends reading if you'd like to know more about that sort of thing. For sure. We should also put a link to that uh, podcast with Jocko Willink and Jordan Peterson. I darn well think we will then, yep. I think that's, uh, that's worthy, worthy of going in our description. Uh, remember, if like what you're seeing, like the video, share it, um, subscribe on YouTube and uh, Podbean. And iTunes, Google iTunes, Play. iTunes, Google yeah. Play. Uh, leave a review. I uh, any questions or comments or things that we're wrong about, you know, absolutely comment and enlighten us. And I think that's about it. We will be getting going on social media 
soon here uh where we're both not uh, incredibly active on facebook or twitter or anything like that but we will have uh pages and twitter handles coming up by i think the next episode we're we're planning on having that all squared away and available for people so as of next time we'll we'll mention all our social media info for uh us to all continue the conversation uh offline or or online more yeah (laughs) we're literally there but uh yeah i think that's everything thank you very much for watching this has been episode four of the northern myths podcast and uh we'll end it off with uh the words of carl jung paraphrasing again um find out what myth you're living so those are some good words and uh hope you uh can uh, get some something out of it like we do So see you all next time. Thank you very much.